Hello, and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about Cytonorm, which was a request from one of you lovely viewers, so thanks again and keep those requests coming. Sorry there was a slight delay in getting this one out, uh, had to find a good longitudinal data set to actually give this one a proper go with. So what is Cytonorm? Well, Cytonorm is an algorithm that you can use to correct for batch effects. Batch effects are things that you may see in your high dimensional flow cytometry or mass cytometry data that are caused by technical variability. So slight shifts in where your populations are sitting day to day as you run the same assays over and over. This is commonly found in say a longitudinal study where you'll be looking at your patients on like day zero and you'll have another patient like four days later, another patient 10 days after that, et cetera, et cetera. And you might see these subtle shifts in where your populations sit over time. This can make analysis difficult because your gates then will also need to simultaneously be shifted patient to patient or you're going to end up with these weird gates in the middle of populations. So cytonorm goes through and corrects for those batch effects. Common factors that you can watch for that can create these batch effects are things like time, so longitudinal studies like I just mentioned. Um, if you're doing a collaboration among different groups of so different labs are involved, you might see slight differences in um, the sample output just because of differences in handling. Um, it also can be between machines. If you're using different machines, you might have slight differences in the data outputs just depending on the optics, the fluidics, the lasers, all of the things that change in different machines. And you also can have batch effects from changing conditions. Um, not something that you would generally want to be openly, commonly doing during a longitudinal study, but this can be used to correct for those as well. Um, and the big thing with batch effects is they can affect the results. And in some cases, batch effects have actually been interpreted as biological differences rather than just actual technical variability. So that's why it is important to keep these factors in mind and may be important for your work to consider some sort of normalization to reduce batch effects if they are occurring. Now, there are a couple limitations when doing this. First up, controls. Like everything else in flow cytometry, proper data normalization and batch correction is going to require a proper control. So to do this, you identically you ideally want this control to be identical across batches. Um, so for example, for a longitudinal study, you might want to set up a positive control that you have from a person or a pool of people that you freeze down and is the same. So every time you run one of your patients, you grab one of your control vials and run it alongside a patient vial. Again, this isn't going to be perfect, perfect because over time and in the freezer, there may be changes that occur to that control, but it is a very fairly reasonable way of providing a control for a longitudinal study. Um, ideally, you want to have the same frequency of negative and positive peaks between your controls on the same day. So even if they're not sitting in identically the same spot, that frequency should be, the simil should be similar. All right, second thing to keep in mind is if you're running these studies between different machines, batch correction or cytonorm needs to have the exact same parameter names in order for it to function. So if you are running between different institutes or between different instruments, make sure that you've also standardized all of your parameter names or you will not be able to apply this algorithm to your data. So let's hop on a screen share and take a look to see how this actually works. All right, welcome back to my desktop. First thing to note is Cytonorm is different from other plugins. So while you're used to doing work on a population using a population plugin, so that would be like the UMAPs or Tisneys we've done on this channel before, this plugin is a workspace plugin. So works at the level of the workspace rather than the level of the population. Because of that, you need to not go with your default method of just drag and drop samples in. So we're going to actually start with an empty workspace, go up here into our workspace populations plugins. It was all shrunk and it tricked me for a second. And we're going to go up here to add workspace plugin. So that is where you would find a workspace level plugin. Down here are your population level plugins. 
So if we click on that, I only have one, so it's going to pop up as cytonorm, and I will click OK. And then from here, you're going to go through and select what you want to use for normalization. So in here, I have this folder set up for my cytonorm data, and I'm going to select that. Cool. All right. So a couple things when you see this screen pop up. First off, you're going to select your control sample. So I know that this is my C1 and my C6. Over here is the name batches. So you can use a keyword in here. You can give it a number, which is nice, or you can use this really nice button up here that's batches by date. And that will basically then, because these were run on separate dates, have them as two separate group packages, essentially. So um, the algorithm will know that these batches all go together because they're the same date, same with these ones here, or the same number or whatever you put in there to denote one batch from the other batch from the other. Now down here, there's this really nice little button that is include controls. This one's kind of neat because it will also then normalize your controls and populate those into your workspace. If you don't check this, you will only have your experimental samples and not your controls, which will make you sad when you go to do your analysis. So you can check that box and click OK. And it's going to then, you'll see this little folder pop up where your cytonorm data will go. And in here, you'll see this happy little box going through doing your analysis. So you can see in here, we now have our cytonorm normalized data populated. Um, we can also go in here if we wanted to create a group and put in our raw data. And go ahead and, oh. can't work my mouse right now, drag and drop those guys in there. Come on, Flojo. Or not. <laughs> <clears throat> not sure why it's letting not letting me do that. Oh. Flojo hates me today. Okay, well, theoretically, you can drag and draw your raw data in there. We'll just toss it over here so we can do the comparison. Okay, so in here, when you open up your data, let's get this matrix applied across the board. All right, so when you open this up, right away from my face, you can go in here and gate like you normally would. Our cells, go in here. Oh, Joe. And do our single cells. And then we'll go in here and let's get rid of our dead cells. Actually, let's do with the CD45 in there. That looks a little ugly, but that's okay. That's just how these samples looked. All right. Alive, CD45 positive. Don't always get nice looking samples as a core manager. So, all right, let's pop in there. So let's set up this guy the same way. So again, we'll take our matrix across everybody. Go in here, get our, I mean, ideally we'd want these in the same workspace so we can use the same gates, but since Flojo is not permitting that at the moment, not liking much of what I'm doing right now, we'll just do it over here and make it as close as we can. I 
It's for viability and CD45. Take these guys here. All right. Then let's get these. Get that hierarchy set up properly first up. And let's get these gates on everybody. And let's get these gates on everybody. So let's start taking a look inside this alive CD45 population. So if we go with our standard, in this case, we did CD3 versus B220. And we'll do the same thing over here. So CD3 versus B220. You can see there are some slight changes in how the data looks, but overall the populations are fairly similar. Um, so we'll gate, say, our CD3 positive. Same thing over here. And go inside there and look at our CD4 versus CD8. This is eight. There it is. C4 versus CD8. All right. So not sure why in the normalized data we have this one dimmer population showing up. I'm going to guess it has something to do with these just not being ideal uh, samples for this because they really aren't ideal for this at all. The controls are not a nice longitudinal control. They're just the control mouse that was used each time. So again, this is not a perfect representation of how this is supposed to work, but gives you just a general idea of the workflow, how to apply it, and how it might change how your data looks. Because you can see there are some pretty distinct differences between this two. Again, I don't believe that this is a biologically proper phenomenon that has occurred. I think this has more to do with just not using appropriate controls that are properly matched with the experimental samples. So a nice example of what can go wrong if you don't apply your controls properly. So as you saw in those plots, there are some pretty big differences between the two. However, I think the differences that we're seeing, especially in those additional populations, is largely due to the fact that I'm not using ideal controls for this. They're not a matched reference control that is properly set up from time point to time point. They were just a control mouse from each day and they were inherently different. I already knew this. So it's not surprising to me that we have some weird populations showing up after normalization. Um, this is a good example of why proper controls are really necessary when you do this. Um, so I will throw in the description a link to a longer Flojo video that goes over Cytonorm, some of the different use cases, use cases, and some of the things you need to keep in mind when you're going to apply this, as well as the link to the original publication so you can take a look at it, get some more details on how the algorithm is working so that you are fully knowledge going in if you want to apply this to your data set. Um, but hopefully that will get you off and running in Flojo, knowing how to actually apply it to your sample since it is a little bit different than a normal population level plugin. So thanks for tuning in. Any other questions, comments, concerns, things you have a deep dying desire to learn more about in flow cytometry, let me know in the comments. And with that, we'll see you in the next one.